did they have to change this damn thing? All right. Okay, that works. Looks good, looks good. Hey. Anyone learn? Here we are. Got a minute? Got a minute? Anyone on? Someone? Chime in? I'm not even sure if the viewer count is actually correct on the Twitch app. Hello? Anyone? Chime in. Send in chat. Anyone in chat? Hey, Onion. Yeah, hey, hide my name. Okay, we got people on. Hey, Onion Lad. We got hide my name, Angela, Own, and M. Daniels. Hello. Okay. Since you're here, need some help. And this is the obligatory mic check, audio check. Mic check, audio check, video check. Hey, Soapy. Hey, Soapy. Hello, check, check, one, two. Mic check, audio check. Hey, the Pharaoh, how are you? Hello. All right, I need someone to chime in. Mic check, audio check. How do we sound? Actually, the video I know is going to sound, uh, the video should be not great. Yeah, you got to log in. One more thing, very important. It's not a real stream until we get lighting. Yes. Sound is good. Audio is good. Now the art. Now the video should be better because we got lighting. Hello, everyone. Hello. 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of the eighth season. Season number eight of my introduction to security class offered at Tufts University. Open to the world on Twitch. Yeah, hey, ASF, okay. Yeah, but we have a brand new set of, we have a, hey, Libby, how are you, XD, how are you? We have a uh, brand new crop of, uh, we have a brand new crop of students and, uh, you know, a bigger audience. So we are back. So, yeah, season number eight. This is going to be, uh, yeah, season number eight. Yeah, season number eight. Uh, that we're offering this on Twitch. Um, I'm Ming Chow. I'm associate teaching professor at Tufts. Yeah. Oh, oh, hi. Oh, hi. Oh, that's a good. That's a great. Um, that's a great uh, handle. When is my? Uh, when is the final exam? So, hey, Richard. How are you? Oh, good afternoon. Good. Good afternoon, indeed. So, uh, season number eight of uh, this. Introduction to security course on Twitch. So why do I do it? Why do I what do I do? Um, Thursdays on Twitch uh, two primary reasons two primary reasons number reason number one is to democratize the education um, Cybersecurity education is still badly needed and even after all these years and quite frankly many colleges and universities don't offer anything like this still yeah believe it or not um and it becomes a public service for me uh and also for tufts as well uh to get the brand out there um it's it, cybersecurity education is just so badly needed i mean and many people especially even now are trying to transition into security and people don't even know where to start um, and as you know, Tufts is really expensive and a lot of people can't afford it. So what is it being, what is it like in a class? Like, what is it like taking an actual Tufts class? So that's reason number one why I continue to do this on Twitch. Number two is, you know, I, I don't know if you folks know, but the introduction to security class at Tufts, um, for the last few years has only gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, I haven't had a, I haven't had an in-person class 
under 100 students for now over four years. And for a lot of students, is uh, it's extremely daunting and intimidating to sit in a classroom. And because this class is so interactive, hey, Tab. Hey, Stacy, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, Stacy's a friend uh, and a cybersecurity practitioner as well. Um, yeah, welcome. Make yourself at home. But yeah, we're going back. The um, the second reason why to do this on Twitch is it. You know, the education. Yeah, Twitch is a medium that you can offer education. Uh, and there are no boundaries. There are no boundaries. You can be do, doing this anywhere in the world. You can be in Italy. You can be in Australia watching this right now. Um, there are no bound, no physical boundaries uh, for this class. And really, with the exception of a few people, I know I, I know Tabby Cat. Uh, I know Tabby Cat. Um, many people. Uh, it's really hard to figure out whether you're a cat or a dog, a real human being, whether you're a learner, whether you're, an, you're a friend, you're a cyber security. We don't know. Um, there's a running joke that the internet, uh, no one knows if you're a cat or a dog. Uh, and people have really liked that style. And of course, these streams are recorded uh, and for you can use it for future reference. These streams are also going to be exported to YouTube. Uh, not only for archive and future reference, just say, for example, knock on wood, I got banned one of these days, but for more importantly, for, for closed captioning. Um, so uh, Twitch streams such as today and moving forward, not only are they going to be available on Twitch, um, at video on demand, but they'll also be on YouTube if you need closed captioning. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, yeah, today's first topic is one that I absolutely love. And in fact, this is a, a topic uh, that I give professional trainings on. And today we're going to do uh, packet analysis using Wireshark. Using Wireshark. That's my email address. That's one of my email address. That's my other work email address at ming at wallasheep.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Now, I'm not the lead of the Wall of Sheep. Um, but uh, I'll give, want to give a shout out to the Wall of Sheep, certainly today. Uh, I wouldn't be here without them. I wouldn't be where I am today in security without the Wall of Sheep. Um, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, for Riverside and the team uh, for uh, getting me to this point in my, not only career, but my life as well. So, thank you. Uh, my heartfelt thank you as always to, uh, to Riverside and to the team. Um, love you guys wherever you are, uh, and that's the social media handle. So, actually, we'll start off with a little motivation. And just, by the way, this is going to be one of the few times I'm going to be using um, slides. But today is going to be nice to use slide because of motivation. So, what in the world is the wall of sheep? So, the wall of sheep. If you ever go to DEF CON, the security conference and the hacking conference that people parents tell you not to go to um, because it is just one of the most infamous conferences around in the world because all certainly are so many hijinks happened. DEF CON is held each summer in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada uh, in the summer, uh, usually around end of July, early August. And if you ever go to DEF CON, um, one of the most sobering um, demonstrations is the Wall of Sheep. So what is the wall of sheep? For years, the wall of sheep monitors arguably the world's most dangerous computer network, which is the DEF CON conference network. Why is that? Um, I remember the days when there were only 100 to a, maybe a small thousand people. Now you have 30,000 people going to DEF CON each and every summer. Yeah, 30,000 is now the number. And for years, the Wall of Sheep monitors the uh, DEF CON conference network. And the reason, and um, like, what do we do? What, what does the Wall of Sheep do to monitor the network? Um, and the Wall of Sheep monitors the network and rips out and identifies anyone who
who is sending sensitive information such as username and passwords using insecure protocols on the internet. Uh, really? People do that? I mean, people do that on, a, on arguably the world's most dangerous network? And by the way, why is it the world's most dangerous network? It's because uh, you have attackers, um, good and bad. You have lawyers, journalists, um, law enforcement. Uh, got now, you even have the White House and government uh, agencies. Uh, Want to give a shout out to the White House, uh, who made a big appearance uh, just past DEFCON. Um, there you have all sorts of people from all walks of life, hobbyists, students, uh, go to DEFCON. Uh, but for years, the DEFCON network was always a place for hijinks. Um, and if you happen to be using, like checking email or checking your bank account using an insecure protocol, like that is not encrypting your traffic, uh, we are go your information will be identified. And, but the wall of sheep, what it does, it shows a list of all the username, password, domains, and, inse and insecure protocols plain text such as HTTP, uh, POP3 for email, IMAP4, uh, and it shows it on this wall. Now this wall of sheep just shows login, um, I forgot what year this was, but it just shows username, password, first three characters of the password um, not censored, but the rest of the password censored. Of course you don't want people to be reusing passwords to go, you know, break into someone's account. That I mean, that's complete, that's illegal. Um, but what this wall of sheep really is, is it's not a wall of shame, but it is an educational tool and opportunity for people to know and to, to know and to understand this is what happens when you are using insecure services on the internet, such as the hypertext transfer protocol for web browsing or POP3 for when IMAP4 for, for email. So it is an educational um, uh, demonstration. Um, it's for you to learn. So a little bit about the packet hacking, now about the Wall of Sheep, and now the packet hacking village. And the Wall of Sheep has now gone really, have grown big, and we are now a village called the packet hacking village. And our mission is security awareness. That's our, that's our, um, our, our mission. And we accomplished that mission by way of interactive demonstration and unconventional methods. Uh, one year, uh, I think it was over a decade ago, we did a fundraiser for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. Uh, we had a peekaboo booth, and that showed like all the pictures that people are looking at on the uh, insecure on uh, on the uh, DEFCON network, of course, using insecure protocol. Uh, are there still modern services that send? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, there are. Some of these protocols were email. Are these, unfortunately, um, the unencrypted and secure protocols are still used day to day all around the world. Uh, a lot of big reason for that is legacy. Uh, the other reason is people just uh, still don't know any better. Yeah, people, there are plenty of people and companies that still don't know any better. And we're all volunteers. We're all volunteers. Uh, we all pay for our own way to Vegas. So... What is this packet analysis thing? What is packet analysis? Now, I highlighted the word packet. I mean, uh, italicized, uh, emphasized on it. Yeah, made, made this force, uh, made this force 116. Yeah, it's, it's, there are still many modern services that send emails unencrypted at, at companies. Um, that, yeah, it's just a sad fact of life and, and tech. Uh, and it's much worse than you think. I mean, you're only, we're only going to scratch the surface, and you're going to see, sadly, a lot more. Um, unfortunately, um, even social media uh, companies have been caught using HTTP still. Not good. And there are news stories about that all the time. It's, it's not good. Packet analysis is better known as understanding and looking at and understanding network traffic. Packet analysis go by many different names, such as analyzing packets, network traffic analysis, packet sniffing, protocol analysis, packet tracing. They're all the same. All the same. Okay? So you may be, it's like, why? Why in the world do you want to use packet? Why do you want to do packet analysis? Well, as you all learn, like everything in security, everything in security, any tool, any technique can be used for both good and bad. 
Packet analysis is an old is an old art and a valuable one. Packet analysis is used to troubleshoot um, network networking issues, including Bluetooth. For recording conversations such as email, voice, and chat, this could be used again for good and bad. I mean, the good is some like you know for like legal reasons you do need to record the conversation. Uh, analyze web traffic, like who's going to where. Uh, reconstruct images and other data transmitted on a network, and to catch username and password, personal information, and other sensitive information that were sent insecurely in plain text. Again, that can be both good and bad. Uh, so, another motivation, and this was, um, I want to give a shout out to Rebecca Alpert. Um, I know they're having an internship there at Red Hat. In fall of 2017, she, was, she took this course. And I'd like to tell everyone that this almost started World War III on Twitter. Um, and I want to also give a shout out to Wired Magazine and Garrett Graf. Uh, great sport. But he wrote an article on the Mirai botnet, and there was this really, really awkward worded article and weird and wired. And I'll read it today. Say, can I quote on the compromised devices? They had to carefully reconstruct the network traffic data and study how the Mirai code launched so-called quote-unquote packets against this target. A little understood forensics process known as analyzing PCAP data. What the hell? Packet PCAP stands for packet capture. Think of it as the digital equivalent of testing for fingerprints or gunshot residue. It was the most complex DDoS software I've run across. At any rate, uh, the whole premise of today, the goal of today is that, well, for me to teach you this, well, quote unquote, so uh, this little understood forensics process known as analyzing PCAP. So what is a packet? A packet is a unit of data. Now, anytime you do a data stream, such as going to a web page, hey, this Twitch stream, this Twitch stream right now, or uh, you're streaming a video, um, downloading whatever, everything that you do on the internet by, you know, again, this Twitch stream is comprised of many, 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 many packets. Okay, so this Twitch stream, there are many, 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 many packets going on, uh, 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 being sent to everyone's computer right now who's watching this stream. In general, a single network, a single uh, packet contains the following information. It got to have the source and destination IP addresses. Um, a lot of times, actually, a lot. Uh, uh, this is one small typo here. So it's, uh, uh, in general, I said, but not all uh, pa network packets will have port numbers. Uh, they're going to have a MAC address, a time to live, and a protocol such as TCP, UDP. Or I oh, another typo. ICMP. Ping. <laughs> Am. A single network packet encapsulates all the layers of what is called the OSI model, or the Open System Inter Interconnection model, okay? So, what is the OSI model? Okay, the OSI model is one of those things I absolutely hate to, um, I hate, and I mean I absolutely hate to talk about, because it is used everywhere, yet it makes no sense. In fact, all the cybersecurity, all the press network practitioners say, it's a framework, but yeah, I mean, there's some of it that's just completely BS. So the OSI model, what it is, is just quote, is just a conceptual framework that describes the function of a network or telecommunication system. All you need to know is I've got two important points. There are seven layers. Each layer is abstracted from each other, and that each is go from the highest layer layer of abstraction, which is layer seven, at the application level uh, layer, all the way down to the physical layer. So there's a diagram right here that shows the layer seven is the application layer, it's the end user layer. These are the tools that the things that the protocol that we all use and love all the time. No one I like to tell everyone, no one gives a shit about presentation and session layer. What we do look at quite often in, in especially for packet analysis is layers four, three, and two. The transport layer, the network layer, and the data link layer. The data link layer is think of it this way. Um, the MAC address, more on the hardware level. 
okay? The network layer, that's where IP address, contains the IP address. No port number, no data, just IP addresses. The transport layer, that's where you have things like host flow control, port numbers, message, uh, message and acknowledgement, TCP flags, uh, the p bits and pieces of the email. That's going to be used, that's going to be seen in the transport layer. Now, the physical layer is going to be the physical structures, like the things that we take for granted, just the physical cables, hubs, repeaters, wire, air, silicon. Here's another um, illustration of the OSI model. Here it is, seven layers, each layer abstracted from each other. This is the, it actually shows, okay, the network uh, layer seven application, uh, the web. Protocols such as F the file transfer protocol, email. Uh, layer six says, you know, data representation and encryption like HTML. The session layer is like, you know, I don't even know here. Uh, transport layer, end-to-end -end connection and reliability or sometimes lack thereof, like TCP. Path determination on logical ad uh, addressing uh, layer three network, that's the IP address. Physical addressing is data uh, data link and binary transmission, media signal, um, RJ45, Cat5 cable, physical layer. But my absolute favorite description of the OSI model I like to tell people is, think about sending a message from one Reddit user to another Reddit user. So. Reddit user sending a message to another Reddit user goes to the application layer. Application layer goes to transport layer. Told you no one cares about layer six and five. Transport layer, internet layer, internet layer, the link layer, link layer, the physical layer. And now we're going back up to the chain to the other message to the other user. Physical layer, link layer, link layer, phys uh, internet layer, internet layer, transport layer, transport layer, application layer, application layer. Now to the Reddit user, Reddit user received a message, you fool. Is it possible to scramble your identifier across layers? The answer is, it is possible to scramble your MAC address for sure. You just now have to be very consistent when you send messages. Because if you break that chain, if you, if, if you decide to scramble your MAC address, uh, and then you decide to break it, then you're not going to get the message. But the answer to I am definitely a dog the answer is, oh yes, there are tools that you can use to scramble your MAC address. Um, and later on, and I think it's next week, is it next week or in two weeks, we're going to talk about, is it possible to scramble or to, 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 to forge information? Yeah, we can do that too. So what is a PCAP file? PCAP will stand for is a packet capture. But PCAP really is a file extension, like dot doc, dot, uh, PDF, .jpg, .pcap is a file extension uh, for packet captures and is commonly used in many applications such as like Wireshark, which we'll be using today. Just to give you an idea, a 100 megabyte PCAP file contains tens of thousands of packets. For years, I used to capture only 64 megabytes because I can send it to a service like VirusTotal for analysis. Yeah, a 100 megabyte PCAP file can contain hundreds, like thousands of packets. And we're going to be using PCAPs and, and Wireshark today. So what in the world is Wireshark? Wireshark is a free and extensive packet analyzer. It's, it's beautiful. Arguably, it is the most important tool for anyone dealing with networks, uh, security or not. Uh, if you're dealing with your, like, networking, Wireshark is your friend. Um, it is the number one tool. Even if you're doing cybersecurity, uh, Wireshark is, like, the number one most important tool to use. For me, it's one of the first tools I, um, I install on a brand new machine. Wireshark is platform independent. It's free and open source. Uh, it contains so many features. Download at Wireshark.org. Yeah. Hey, hee hee. Yeah. So I want to give you a little preview. Now, this is a little, I like this interface so much better than a newer interface. The Wireshark interface, there are four big components. First is a, is a toolbar, so you can do things like filtering and search. Then there's a table of all the packets. That's the packet list pane. Packet detail pane below the table is just, a, you can actually break down a packet into readable format. Okay, drill down. And then last but not least is the binary, uh, the packet bytes pane. It's going to show you the uh, the binary of the uh, uh, of the um, 
of the packet, which you, and each and every time when you mouse over or hover over, let's say a field, in either the packet list pane or on the table, it will show you exactly where that information is located in the binary, okay? This is the old interface. The newer interface will, is actually the, it's not the packet list at the packet details pane and then followed by the packet bytes pane below. Now the, those panes are to the left and to the right of each other, left and right. So there's really only like one, two, three major sections now with the thirds at the bottom is packet details and the packet bytes. So, so this is where I'm going to open up my web browser. Yes, that's the course web. So I'm going to get a github.com. Uh, mchow01 and boot camp. All the PCAPs that we're going to use today, all the files that we're going to use today, are here in this repository. And I can paste that in chat. Oops. Hello? My mouse. Ah, here it is. Okay, so all the uh, all the uh, PCAPs are here that we're going to use. And let's take a look at the first one. Let's do the first exercise. Open a simple PCAP in Wireshark. Yay. So I'm going to go to set one that PCAP. You can just go here and down and go to the uh, download. Download the raw. I'm just going to, can I copy the link? Uh, hold on, go to raw, ah, here we go, yeah, copy link, all right, set one up, PCAP. I'm actually here, I'm just going to paste it, and I'm just going to download it to my desktop. Okay, so you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to open up my terminal. And the reason why I'm going to open up my terminal, and we're going to use the terminal quite a bit today. Mac OS, I use the terminal because, you know, it makes things faster. And you can see things under the hood pretty nicely. I'm going to go to my desktop. Clear the screen. And I do an ls. And you can see set one up pcap. Now... Uh, for those of you who already did the first, the first lab on Linux command, how can you take a peek at the contents of a file using a command line? Like, what's the command do you use? Now, anyone? Uh, oh, okay, M. Daniel said cat. I'm definitely a dog, said cat. When is the final exam? Yeah. So if I do, yeah, you can use, um, let's use cat. What's, what does cat mean? Cat is to concatenate and print files. I like cat. All right, I like cats. So let's do cat set one dot pcap. What this is going to do is going to echo or print out the contents of the file. Are you ready? Now, I'm going to, I haven't hit the enter key yet, but I will say cat set one dot pcap. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, hey, what just happened? Did anyone just notice just what, what just happened? What's on, the, what's on the terminal screen right now? Can anyone notice anything? What's the output like? Hold on for a second. Let's do this again. It's not exactly. When it's the final exam, it's not humanly readable. If you do an ls, now I just want to just do an ls minus l to list out the file. Set one that pcap is only seven hundred and fifteen bytes. It's a set one that pcap is a very small file. So I'm gonna do cat set one that pcap again, and exactly it looks like, yeah, it looks like exactly that. It's not human readable. It's like it's not human readable. It looks like crap, and almost nothing is readable. Although if you look carefully, there is something that is readable. All right, so now. 
this is what happens when you, oh, what happens I do a file set one.tcap? Interesting. The, what the file command do, it will actually print out what kind of a file this is. And set one.pcap is indeed a pcap capture file. Okay, good. Now what happens if we try to open it up in the, uh, uh, set one.pcap and Wireshark? Now I have Wireshark installed. Um, what you can do is you can go to wireshark.org and you can download Wireshark for free. Um, uh, use your own personal computer for, oh, 4.0, coming soon. Put a download button. Ah, here it is. Yeah, platform independent. Okay, so assuming that you've downloaded Wireshark, And this is what happens. Yay! Y'all see? All right, that's Wireshark. Now watch what happens. I guess gonna. Now watch what happens when I try to open. Go to my desktop. And open up set one. Set one to set one, set uh, 715 bytes. Bing! Welcome to Wireshark, everyone. Welcome to Wireshark. Here you go. This is a far cry from this mess right here. Yeah, in the terminal, if you do a cat of set one up, peek out, everything looks like, look like garbage. Now it looks pretty nice here in a Wireshark. Now you see a table, I mean, okay, so here's a toolbar. Here's your table of packets. That's your drill down pane, and that's the binary pane on the right, uh, bottom right. Bottom left is the drill down. Right now, there's no packets selected. Well, we'll select the first packet. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, you get the whole packet here. Look at that. I'm, wait, I'm, uh, yep, I'm, I'm highlighting the first packet, second packet, third packet, fourth packet, fifth packet, sixth packet, seventh packet, eighth packet. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. So if you drill down on this frame one, that shows you everything about the packet. But Ethernet two, this is layer two, IPv4. Layer three. See, the only thing you care about is the protocol, source, destination, address. And of course, transmission control protocol, layer four. Source port, destination port. Oh, yeah. Look at that. And you can see, yeah. So let's go to the exercise. So let's go to the questions. Question number one, how many packets are there? Question number two, what network of order call is being used? Question three, now, question three and four, you got to be very careful. What is the source IP address? What's the destination address, uh, destination IP address for question number four? Question number five is what port number is the source list uh, using to communicate with the destination? Or what port number is the destination listening on? The bonus is, do you notice the three-way hand, the TCP three-way handshake? All right, let's go through these questions. The first question is, okay, how many packets are there? How many packets are there? All you need to do is to uh, just count the number of columns, a uh, number of rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just eight. Yeah, number. Only eight packets in set one dot pcap. Only eight packets in set one dot pcap. Now, question number two is uh, what protocol, uh, networking pro what networking protocol is used? That one is also pretty clear. Take a look at the table. Take a look at the protocol. Each and every packet is using TCP. TCP is layer four on the OSI model. In fact, just to be interesting, um, there is no application protocol being used here. It's just straight TCP, okay? Not SSH, not HTTP, not HTTPS. Uh, they all are a TCP packet as well, but uh, Wireshark is very good at being very specific on the protocol as well. Question number three, what is the source IP address and question number four is, what's the destination IP address? Well, let's take a look here. 
There's only two IP addresses that we have, 192.168.1.3, Sorry, Those are the only two IP addresses that we have. But which one is the source and the destination, and how can we be so sure? Well, let's take a look. There's two IP addresses, 192.168.1.3 and then 192.168.1.8. In the info column, that's like a snapshot of like the packet, think of it that way. You see there are two numbers here that are separated by a, 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 an arrow, a, a right, an arrow that's going to the right. So these two numbers, what the hell are these two numbers? In fact, they're port numbers. If you take a look at layer, uh, uh, the transmission control protocol drill down, which is layer four, source port is 489859 and the destination is 7777. Interesting. So how you read the first packet is, the source IP address at 192.168.1.3 at port 49859 is sending a sync packet, SYN, to 192.168.1.8 at port 7777. And the second packet gets interesting. It is 192.168.1.8 is sent at port 7777, is sending a sync ACK packet to 192.168.1.3 at port 49859. And then last but not least, 192.168.1.3 at port 49859 is sending a ACK packet. Ah, TCP three-way handshake, folks. Sync, sync ACK and ACK. Sending an ACK packet to 192.168.1.8 at port 7777. So, Notice the three TCP three-way handshake, which is, again, a reminder, uh, the TCP three-way handshake is used to create a reliable connection between two computers, sync, sync, ACK, and ACK. So notice the sync, sync, ACK, and ACK, and you know that the source is the one that sends the sync. So, yeah, the source is, in this case, really is 192.168.1.3. The destination IP address is 192.168.1.8. I get the question, what is ECE and CWR? I get that question all the time. I still, I mean, I just looked that up. I, I don't know. I, I, I keep on forgetting. And, of course, as you can see later on, you, someone is going to do an FIN, which means goodbye. SYN, ACK... PSH, ACK, and FIN, those are what you call TCP flags. Those are on layer four, not layer three. Okay? And what port number is a source using to communicate with the destination, or what the port number is the destination listening on, and that is going to be port 7777. Now, you may be wondering and curious, why the hell are we using port 7777 for? Well, there's a reason. As you will see throughout this whole course, for many, and, and, and for over, I don't know, how many weeks, like 13 weeks, you're going to see that port 7777 is um, generally used for nefarious purposes. You're going to see port 7777 used all the time. But today, seven, seven, what's going on in port 7777 is harmless. Now let's go to a second exercise, which is let's reconstruct a conversation in Wireshark. So in set one dot pcap, this this set right here, what the heck is 192.168.1.3 sending to port? Uh, uh, what is 192.168.1.3 sending to 192.168.1.8? Like what message is being sent, or what is being done? Well. How you reconstruct a conversation in Wireshark works like this. Click on a packet, or click on a, a, a packet, really any of the packet. Right click on that packet, go to follow, and then follow the stream. It could be, it usually should show TCP stream is the most common if the TCP protocol is used, or something more specific. 
So in this case, on set number one, all you need to do is just right-click. Uh, let's say, okay, let's say the fourth packet. Right-click on this, follow, and the only option I get is TCP stream. So if I do a follow TCP stream on this, and here we go. Well, and here is the resulting stream. To follow the stream, this window, what you can do is you can show the data as many different formats. Now, by default, the format that's going to be used, I don't know why it's on raw this time, it's going to be show. you should, in this case, you should show the data as ASCII or ASCII text. Well, there you go. This entire conversation is 15 bytes. And if you show the data, the stream in ASCII format, you'll see, well, the only text is, what me worry? And that, and that makes sense. What me worry with a question mark at the end of the string is 15 bytes. You can also save this stream as raw data to your desktop, to your, to your file system, like to your desktop. You can print this. You can filter it out. If there are more than one file in this entire conversation, actually between 192, yeah, here it is. Look at this. 192.168.1.3 at port 49859 is sending 15 bytes, which is what me worry, to 192.168.1.8 at port 7777. If there are more than one file that are being sent, you can go and click this up arrow on streams, and you go to stream 1, that shows the second file of the stream. In this case, there is no other file or data sent, you know, from from 192 to 168 to 193 to 168 to 192 to 168 to 198. So it's going to be starting at zero. The indexing is always going to start at stream zero. There's nothing else here. So there's no like second or third, second or third file. The next PCAP set will work with, yes, there will be a more than one file sent uh, in a conversation. Yeah. Right click on any other packet, follow. Go to follow TCP stream. Yep, there you go. Again, uh, ECE and CWR, I said earlier, I always have to look them up. I don't know off the top of my head. Ah, right, here it is. Yeah, just look this up. Uh, here, it says, these flags are used together with two flags in the IP header to warn senders of congestion in the network, thereby avoiding drop, okay, avoiding packet drop and transmission. Don't worry about it. Uh, what is the maximum number of bytes per packet? Oh, that's a good question. There is one. It's not like a gig. Maximum number of bytes per packet. Maximum packet size for a TCP connection. Here it is. Very common. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it in chat. But how is this information logged? That is the conversation for next Tuesday. The absolute uh, limitation on a TCP packet size is 64K. There you go. So uh, it's unironically un over, it's 64 kilobytes, 6, 65,535 bytes. But this is practically, this is a far larger than the size of any packet that you will see because the lower layers like Ethernet have much lower packet sizes. Okay, that's the short answer. Good question. Uh, so... You may be wondering, what's the difference between HTTP, HTTPS, and VPN traffic? Well, I'm actually going to do a demonstration of that. So back in the heydays, uh, there was a tough, uh, there was a website that was created by, I, think it, I forget who it was, that supported both HTTP and HTTPS, which is Tufts.io. So there are three... PCAP files that I have in this repository here. Tufts.io-insecure, Tufts.io-secure, Tufts.io-vpn.pcap. And I have a copy of each and every one of these PCAP files. 
Is it illegal to capture on a, a network that you don't own, Richard Starr? <sighs> well, you bring up a very great conversation. Richard, people do it all the time on networks that they don't own. Think of a coffee shop. People do it all the time. Like a lot of, what, what did I just say? I mean, unfortunately, I mean, it, it feels like an honor system, but people do it all the time. I mean, then again, if a wall of sheep, like we don't own the network, but we capture the packets. So here's the one, Richard, your question, I think, should deserve a gold star because there is an important lesson that is to be learned here. Anyone can capture packets. You always assume that people are capturing packets wherever you are. Legal, non-legal, doesn't matter. Oh, wrong folder. So I'm going to go to boot, uh, the boot camp. I'm going to actually, hear it is. Tufts.io-insecure.pcap. Tufts Here you go. And this PCAP file, this is going to Tufts.io, HTTP colon slash that. Tufts.io. 347 packets only. Now what happens if I, uh, now here's a little trick, one thing that is generally true. You can see there's a lot of human readable information such as like HTTP verbs. Anytime you see green, it usually, a lot of, I think most times when you see green columns in uh, green, green rows in Wireshark, uh, it means HTTP or insecure. So if you right click on uh, the HTTP packet, in this case it's 138, and then you follow, you have an option of following either TCP stream or HTTP stream. Remember HTTP uses, uh, is built upon TCP, but HTTP is a more specific version. So if you do that, look at what happens. You see all the HTTP information and even binary data. I don't even know what this is. There's a lot of readable information here. So what happened if I go to stream? Oh yeah, you go to stream six. There's a lot of files associated with uh, 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 in this Tufts IO dash insecure.pcap. Oh, look at that. You can even see like HTML and JavaScript code. Oh yeah. Yep, that's JavaScript code. Yeah. But watch what happens. Now, here's the filter bar. I'm going to clear this out. So again, this is going to have 347 packets. There's a dirty trick that you can do. So I'm going to go to my desktop right now, and I'm just going to remove everything, which is RM star. Don't try to be careful when you do RM star. And Wireshark, you can dump all the insecure content that contains, like all the HTTP contents in a PCAP file, if it has any. Go to File, Export Objects, and then you can export all the HTTP objects. Look at that. Look at that. Wireshark is smart enough to identify that in Tufts IO dash insecure PCAP, it can rebuild main.css, jQuery uh, jQuery.min, Look at that, the favorite icons. Let's save all to our desktop. There's nothing on the desktop right now. Save it and close. Take a look. There you go. You can see all the icons and stuff, jQuery files, CSS files. It all gets recreated because we're going to HTTP colon slash slash Tufts dot IO. Now what happens if you go to you if you go to HTTPS colon slash slash Tufts dot IO? Now this uses HTTPS. By the way, notice the TCP three-way handshake. Sync, sync, ack, and ack. Uh, let me do this for Tufts Insecure as well too. You also see the TCP three-way handshake. Okay, so TCP three-way handshake is really important. Now watch what happens if I try to right-click on, oh, wait, it's a green packet here. That means it's insecure, right? 
yeah, but this has nothing to do with uh, Tufts.io. This is a Firefox thing going to get some certificates. That's it. There's no other data. What happened if I go to File, Export Objects, and Export HTTP? Nothing. Nothing related to Tufts.io. I prefer Mac OS because it just, I prefer Mac OS, and the reason is it got, it got uh, it, the Unix, because it got Unix as the underlying foundation of the operating system. Uh, I mean, that's why the terminal is built in. I mean, that's my bread and butter on a day. That's my daily driver. There's a reason why I use Mac OS, because of the foundation of Unix. It's not hardcore Linux. I mean, Linux is, well, that has its own problem, but things just work on Mac OS. But I also got the uh, Unix foundation as well, too. So I can do all my favorite commands in the world on the terminal. That's the reason why. Yep. That's the reason why. What the hell? Let's go to Wireshark. And now what happens if you try to visit Tufts.io on a VPN? This is VPN traffic. You're not going to see anything. So you're going to see the VPN providers at 35.2023.133.219 and that's it. You can't make anything out of this. So the moral of the story is really, yeah, just use encryption. Yep, use encryption. Okay. So again, uh, ESP protocol. Oh, that's a good question. What is the ESP protocol? I think that has to do with some VPN, uh, IPsec. IPsec. IPsec is a secure network protocol that's generally used for VPNs. Ah, eh, good question. Yep. The encapsulating security payload. Yep. Good question. Yeah, so ESP protocol is, uh, you know, for VPNs. Encapsulated security protocol. All right. Set2.pcap. We're now going to extract pictures. Now, I'm actually going to send you the link on. Go to raw, copy the link. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, good question. Yeah, Linux on Mac OS is not perfect right now. Okay, is there any benefit to utilizing a dedicated IP address that are offered by VPN? Yeah, um, one is, my, I mean, off the top of my head, one is location, two is probably easier to remember. Okay, set2.pcap. Now, let's, this uh, pcap file, let's extract pictures. Open up set2.pcap in Wireshark. What is the insecure protocol that was used to transmit pictures on the network? How many pictures were transmitted? and extract one of the pictures that was transmitted. Hint, show and save the picture format as raw. Okay. So I'm gonna open up set2.pcap. Set2.pcap is 390, 391 kilobytes. Set number two, set2.pcap, this has only 482 packets. 482 packet, but wait a minute, wait, 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 here it is. You, you see the TCP three-way handshakes on the first three packet. First packet is a sync packet, second packet is a sync ACK packet, and the third packet is ACK. Anyone notice what is protocol is used? What protocol do you notice? What protocol do you notice? after TCP. Oh yes, the file transfer protocol. And I've said a number of times in various different places that the file transfer protocol is notoriously insecure. Everything is sent in plain text. <laughs> it's ironically over. <laughs> well played. And we all understand why it's such a f***ing terrible protocol. Right click on the packet, follow TCP stream. It's your only option. Ooh. Ooh. This ain't good. 
this isn't that good. Now we see FTP the server and this is this first stream whenever you connect when you ever connect to an FTP server the first thing that you're going to see is a transaction log. Uh, and a transaction log will actually show you the username and the password in plain text of the person who logged in. In this case the user is woodworm and the password is baby shark. That's not good. But we'll also, you also see the name of the files that got transmitted. I see one JPEG, another JPEG, a text file, excuse me, another text, another JPEG, and another JPEG. That's not good. Can we actually see the JPEG and the text file in this PCAP set? The answer is yes, we can. Go up a stream. Stream zero is usually the transaction log. The next stream should be the first JPEG that got transmitted. And there it is. Ooh. Can you see anything human readable here? I see JFIF, blah, blah, blah. I see copyright 2007 Apple. I see gobbledygook, but I also see readable data here. I see RGB used a lot. Man, yeah, doesn't that sound like gra something graphic here? Oh, I see Photoshop. This is actually binary data of a picture. Another JFIF. Photoshop. LCD. Apple Inc. Not good. Binary data of a picture. I see a text file. This is Dan Gears. Uh, happy 10th anniversary soon to Dan. This is his. This was his keynote to the Black Hat conference in 2014. You can. We can just save this as. Save it on our desktop. Speech.txt. I hate this new version of Wireshark. That I, I hear it is. Stream number four. Another JFIF. I'm definitely a dog. Can you show the binary of data? Yes, we can. Why don't we actually go to the beginning? We don't need to want to show, show this as binary. This one we show it, want to show as binary. Also, and save it to our desktop. So I'm definitely a dog. What we're going to need to do is this. You see it said show data as? Change the uh, change it from ASCII to raw. This is binary. Save as out file one. This was another JFIF. If I do a ASCII, yep. Got a raw. Save as out file two. This was Dan Gear's uh, speech. ASCII, we don't need to say. We just save this as ASCII. This, from ASCII to RAW, save as. And one more. Just want to show you, this is JFIF. Here's the thing. You don't want to save this data as ASCII on your desktop because then... It's just going to be text, not the picture. So knowing that this looks like binary data of a picture, you want to save it as raw so it can be well reconstructed on your desktop, uh, on your system. I'll file four. All right, I'm going to close this. I'm going to open up a terminal. Now I have out file one, out file two, out file three, and out file four. If I do can, uh, more, speech.txt, there you go, Dan Gears talk. I'm going to clear the screen to an LS again. Now, if I do a file, out file one. Oh, by the way, this is, this is why I really hate PowerPoint sometimes, but that's okay. All right, here you Here's my desktop. Out file one, out file two, out file three, out file four, and the speech. But notice what happened when I did ran the file command on out file one. It's a JPEG image data. 
And hopefully this will be a lesson learned why um, file extensions are really critical. Here's a little nice little hack for you if you ever want to rename a file. Use a move command. Move out file one to be out file one.jpg. Watch what happens. Yes, M. Daniels, you are correct. File, out file two. Yep, JFIF, JPEG. Move, out file two, to out file two, dot JPEG. File, out file three. It's also a JPEG. Also a JPEG. Ah, damn it. The first picture that was sent to the FTP server. The second picture that was sent to the FTP server. Dan Gear's speech. The third picture that was sent to the FTP server. And finally, the fourth picture that was sent on the FTP server. There you go. So now we just reconstructed all the files that were sent to the FTP server. And we can do this because, thank you for worse, but really for worse, if the file transfer protocol doesn't encrypt anything. Everything is sent in, quote unquote, in the clear. Yep. There you go. All right, we'll do two more PCAP sets. I know that. Now, let's do something a little more complicated. We already ran through command line tools. I mean, I'm already, I showed you file, more, cat. Strings will be used quite a bit. I just want to let you know about um, command line tools. Very important for cybersecurity. And it requires years of practice. No one, and I mean no one, is going to master the command line in one sitting. And reading a book is not good enough. You really just need to practice all the time. Reconstructing a media file. Now I am going to uh, you, let's, you open up set3.pcap. Now set3.pcap is a little larger. Mm. Is FTP still good? Yes, because it is secure. Absolutely. Great question. Um, yes, F SFTP is all good to use. Because it has a yes. Set3.pcap. So a little more involved. But it also can fool you. I'm going to close the uh, clear the filter. Click on the S, uh, the X on the filter bar. Let's open up set3.pcap, which is 30. 8.6 megabytes. Here we are. This set3.pcap had one, two, three. You can see the sync, sync, act, and act. The TCP three-way handshake. But oh, for this pcap set, there's 38,469 packets. But interestingly, there's only two IP addresses here: 192.168.1.228 and 192.168.1.20. So what's the source and destination IP addresses and what port number is on the server that the client sends the media file to? Well, let's take a look. You see the sync sync act and act here, so, but notice the info column, you have source port to destination port. I see port 7777 is used again. So 192.168.1.228 by the way, you can go to the Ethernet uh, uh, Ethernet section. You can see the source is an Apple device, probably my MacBook, and the destination is something on VMware, which is 192.168.1.20. The Ethernet is a MAC address, so whenever you send a packet, you also need to uh, have not only source and destination IP addresses, but also source and destination MAC addresses as well too. So the destination, the server is at 192.168.1.20, protocol TCP, port 7777. 
The only protocol, interestingly, is only used a TCP protocol. But what kind of a media file is this? Do you right click follow TCP stream? Now be very careful. Do not save the data out to your, to your computer until the client packet count here stops. Right now you can see the counter going from 20, 21, 22, 20. Make sure it stops. And we're going to show the data as raw, which is good. So I'm going to save this. All right, because the data is already raw, this counter stopped. The entire conversation 37 megabytes. I'm just going to save this as media on my desktop. That's it. Now going back here, if you want to see this as ASCII text, you're not going to read anything. Alright, so now I'm going to open up my terminal again, and now I'm going to do a file media. Ooh, it's an Apple QuickTime movie. I'm going to rename media to media.mov. And what you should get is this. Hey, what? The rain's gonna start. Once upon a time, I was born in love. Now I'm only falling apart. I don't know what to do. So it gets Yeah, so I'm gonna play that again. The rain's gonna start. Yep, Cabby Cat, you know, but you know the story. So the story of that video is that was from DEF CON in 2019, before, well, before the world shut down. And it was um, myself, Josh Abraham, and Peter Keenan, all three of us. Um, let's say that I got myself into some trouble that night, um, crashing a friend's party, which I was not invited to. But we were going to meet up there anyway, and... Uh, I used to drink uh, back in the back in the days, um, and that was the piano bar at the Paris Hotel and Casino. And it was myself, Josh, and Peter. We just talked and talked, and we had a grand, grand time um, that evening. Want to give a shout out to Josh. Want to give a shout out to Peter. Um, I remember there was a good couple of years that I said, I don't even know when we're going to see anyone again. I don't even know if we'll go, I'll ever go back to Vegas again. Uh, well, you know, those couple of years were not fun. Um, gone back the last couple of years in Vegas is always a great time. Um, the biggest difference now are two things. I don't drink anymore. Um, I don't miss it. But the piano bar there, um, yeah, that's gone. That's, that's been gone. Uh, that's letting out. It's gone from the Paris. Yeah. Fun times, good times. Yeah, so now we only got a few minutes left. So let's talk about what we do, like the username, and, let's talk about username and passwords. The first thing I wanna let you all know is something called encoding schemes. There is an encoding scheme that is called Base64. Base64 is an encoding stream that is used to translate binary data into ASCII text. Because as you saw earlier when I did a cat of the PD of uh, the PCAP file, you see what happened when you try to X print out binary data on a terminal screen. Funny things happen. Please understand that Base64 is not encryption. It is not encryption. It is not encryption. It is not encryption. It is not encryption. Unfortunately, it is still looked at as encryption because why is this important? There is a type of credential called a basic HTTP4 authentication. Uh, you probably have used this all the time. A request containing a header field of the form authorization colon base, base colon base basic, followed by a space, 
and I'm followed by a credentials and base 64 en uh, coding, uh, encoding. What it is, is just an encoding of the ID and the password joined by a colon. So let me show you what an example of base 64 really is. It's just a scheme. So I'm just going to go to base 64 decode, base 64 decode.org. We're going to use this site often. Oh yeah, many Vegas stories later on in this course. So I'm just going to type in, I'm just going to encode. Let me encode a string called V. Sayamo. So that's a string. The encoded equivalent is this mess right here. With an equal sign. By the way, why does base 64 strings usually sometimes end with an equal or equal equal sign? Padding. And this is important recognition because um, I should get that. Ah, why does a base 64 encoder string have an equal sign in the end? I'm going to put this on record. Padding. Serves a padding. Yep. So I'm going to take this encoded base 64 string. I'm going to decode it now. And there you go. V underscore Bersayamo. Yeah. And again, it is not encryption. It is just not encryption and not encryption, but it's often recalled and mistaken for encryption. Now let's do this exercise. Extracting username password pairs. Set four. All right, set four dot pcap. We're going to open up set four dot pcap right now. 16.98. 16 16.98. Mm. 16 yeah. Set four dot pcap only has 170 packets. But this is where you want to use the filtering. What protocol was used to transmit the username password pair credentials? Now we got to find them. But here's the pattern we're going to use to find any HTTP basic uh, base 64. Here's the key. Not you're not going to see this often anymore, but unfortunately, it's still used. This is one of many ways and a very easy way to see if uh, username and password are sent by way of HTTP. Is to look for the string authorization colon space basic. Okay, let's see. Click on the magnifying glass here. So, okay, search for packet details, now and wide. Look for the string and type in authorization colon space basic. Now click find. Ooh, we found one. We found one. We're going to copy, right click on uh, copy, copy value. I'm going to go to a base 64 decoder. We'll move, we have to move the basic, it's just Y. Yeah, I'm going to paste it in chat. That's credential number one. Decode it. B. Rogers colon, they played with great character. That's credential number one that we found. Find another one. Is there another one here that is authorized? I start with authorization colon base basic. Ooh, we found another one. 
right click on this copy the value it starts with capital Y and J here's another credential No, 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 no. Is it? No. I'll find another one. Here it is. ZG1, Kari. Decode, D Moyes colon, I am a football genius. Is there another one? Yeah. There is a YW. What the hell? Looks like there are three of them here. Copy the value. And this one is A. Ausler colon ID 10T expert. We have any more? Nope. Done. Found. Now the question is, do they go to the wall of sheep? Are they valid or not? Why or why not? Now here's an important note. Do not go to the website or domain and enter in the username and password to determine if it's valid. Why not? That's unauthorized access, that's illegal, and you can be prosecuted by way of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But fear not. If you actually want to validate the, if a username and password credential is valid or not, all you need to do is something that we learned earlier. Right click, follow, and we're going to follow HTTP stream. And this would actually tell you if you see OK, login, and oh, uh oh. oh. That's not good. So for the credential Y and J, it gets a 401 authorization required. Yeah, yeah. Either you supplied the wrong credential, bad password, or your browser doesn't understand how to. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, that B. Rogers one looks like this isn't going to fly. That's not good. What about the other one? The ZG11. Follow TCP stream. Follow HTTP stream. Ooh. 401. Not good. Ooh. And how about the YW91 one? Right click follow HTTP stream on that. That's also a 401. Authorization required. So while we found three username and password pairs, none of them actually had any success. It should have been said like something like successful, login OK, HTTP 200, but we only get four once. That's not good. So all the credentials that we found were not good. Let's start from the beginning. But remember the ZG1 here when we actually sent the base64 string to like base64decode.org, that website? What if I told you that Wireshark actually already decoded this, decoded the credential for you? You see this right here under authorization colon basic and then the, and then the uh, base64 string? You can just expand it. Deep Moyle, I'm a football genius. Yeah, Wireshark already done this for you. Yep. A. Ausler, ID10T expert. Yeah, yeah. B. Rogers, they played with great character. Yep. D. Moyes, I'm a football character. A. Ausler. Yeah. One more trick. Just want to also let you know. Uh, one more thing. Uh, there is a really quick and dirty way to find credentials uh, in, in Wireshark. You open up a packet, a PCAP set in Wireshark, just go to Tools, the Tools menu, go to Credentials. 
and it will just rip out all the credentials that if uh, in a PCAP if it finds any. In this case, you can see the packet numbers, the protocol that's being used, uh, username that were found, and the uh, but it doesn't show you the credential. But it will also an extremely important uh, while Wireshark uh, the tool credentials feature will identify the packet location of where the credentials were found. There is no way that it can actually determine if the uh, credentials were actually legitimate or valid or good or not. That's up to you to do. You have to manually do check it yourself to check for validity. So don't just take this for granted. But yeah, I mean, if you use uh, tools or uh, credentials, you can find uh, all sorts of credentials that are in a PCAP set, like HTTP basic credentials, uh, IMAP, uh, email, um, so many different types of protocols uh, and credentials, so much stuff. So that's all we got for today. So like, where do you go from here? The sniff and validate passwords where you can go reconstruct con files. Uh, this is, uh, you know, you can always volunteer at the Wall of Sheep and the Packet Hacking Village. We have a lot of events and games to play, such as Packet Inspector, Packet Detective. Uh, you can also, if you're really good at this stuff, you can enter in the Capture the Packet, which is a black badge contest. A DEF CON black badge will give you lifetime admissions to DEF CON. Yeah, and that is all for today. And next week, we're going to do reconnaissance, network recon. All right. And so that's, that's it. That's episode number one, folks. Yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Take care. Thanks, everyone.